Good morning. I am not Dr. Christiania Abela. <laughs> I'm introducing her. I'm Pat Berman. And I actually have the great honor to introduce Dr. Christiana Abela, a distinguished authority on Latvian art. Dr. Abela is a lecturer in the Department of Art History and a senior research scholar at the Institute of Art History of the Art Academy of Latvia in Riga. She received her bachelor's, master's, and PhD from the Latvian Academy of Art and has subsequently published numerous books, articles, book chapters, uh, and including monographs on Pietrus Krastins and Johann Walter, both with Neptune's Press in Riga. She's also the author of significant sections of the art history of Latvia, in addition to editing volumes of the materials for Latvian art history. She also edited the special issue, Representing Art History in the Baltic Countries, Experiences and Prospects of the Estonian Studies of Art in 2018, just last year. Her numerous publications range from questions of identity and territoriality in Latvia, art historiography, institutional histories, transnationalism, and critical heritage and ethnic studies. Her topic today is, seems to me to be a perfect keynote, considering patronage, the production of knowledge, cultural entanglements, nomenclature, and other questions that will be opened up in the next two days. The topic is the Nordic horizon of the emerging Baltic uh, art, a view from Riga at the turn of the century. Welcome. Thank you for this introduction. Uh, good morning, uh, everybody. I hope that you can hear me. Okay. If something goes wrong, just let me know. <laughs> Around 1900, striving to become part of a Nordic cultural context united by the Baltic Sea, or thinking of itself in Nordic terms permitted much of the new developing visual culture, visual and literary culture in the Baltic provinces of the Russian Empire, both from the standpoint of territorial, respectively Baltic identity, and ethnic, respectively Latvian, Estonian, Baltic, German specificity, and uh, in the introduction by Bart, we, we already uh, encountered the concept of Baltic as uh, referring to the Baltic Sea region, uh, actually something that uh, from the viewpoint of our countries would be described uh, rather as Nordic, but uh, from the viewpoint of Scandinavia, it's entirely Baltic. This Baltic exhibition in 1914, uh, without the participation of <laughs> those countries uh, that consider uh, them Baltic and uh, uh, the Baltic uh, provinces of the Russian Empire. Art-related evidences of these aspirations. Oops, sorry include, among many other, for instance, the adopted pen name Norden of the influential Baltic German art critic Julius Hasselblatt of Estonian origin, a general longing to emulate Finland in terms of artistic emancipation, represented most notably and conceptually by Latvian painter Janis Rosenthal's, the imagery and uh, contemporary reception of the internationally acclaimed turn of the century landscapes by his compatriot Wilhelm Spurvitis, as well as the presence of Finnish and Swedish art in the exhibition program of the Riga Art Society, Riga Kunstverein. The meaningful fascination of the North, in, to give a brief synopsis of what I will focus on in my presentation, was so pervasive that the Milgraves Social Society in Riga, supported by Latvian industrialist and patron of the arts, August Dombrovskis, adopted the name Ziemilblasma, Aurora Borealis, in 1903, and Latvian writer Karl Skalbe established the cultural magazine Kavi, Arctic Lights, in 1905. 
One of the most notable cases with regard to the Nordic context was the ambitious project of the international Nordic exhibition, Nordische Ausstellung, for the opening of the Riga City Art Museum proposed uh, to the Riga Art Society in 1904 by its active member, Roderich von Engelhardt, initially acclaimed by the society leaders and already advertised internationally, it sparked a huge wave of protest by the majority of local artists, including Rosenthal's, and was cancelled. This initiative and its failure elucidate controversial aspects of Baltic artistic self-perception against the real and imaginary Nordic background. In the volume of the art history of Latvia, about the turn of the century, years between 1890 and 1915, its editor-in-chief, his art historian Professor Eduard Sklavinsch, proposed to see and describe this time in Latvia as a period of neo-romanticist modernism, arguing that, uh, I quote, under the conditions of increasing capitalist urbanization and industrialization, as well as other factors, the modernization of art took on the aesthetic values of a renewed romanticism. This work of our team, as many of you uh, already know as readers, uh, is structured into chapters um, about particular branches of art, uh, so fine arts, architecture, uh, applied art, uh, and so on, thus leaving undiscussed or insufficiently discussed many of those uh, developments which manifest themselves simultaneously in various forms of artistic culture. Throughout this book, they spark here and there in a scattered way, uh, inspiring perhaps uh, to go on with research and reflection. Thus, a background question of my talk today is how the manifold contemporary perception of what I would like, uh, I, what I invite to imagine as the Nordic horizon, interaction with it and contribution to it, elucidate this uh, neo-romanticist modernism. In order to give you a glimpse into the fragmentary research prehistory of my subject, I must go back to the 1980s, the late Soviet years, when two studies by Eduard Sklavinsch were published as humble, reprinted teaching aids, outlining first uh, the stylistic and iconographical spectrum of Latvian, but not only ethnic Latvian art of the late 19th and early 20th century. And next, the contacts of ethnic Latvian fine art with other national schools uh, at the turn of the 20th century. In the first of these works, Klavinsch mentioned that a part of landscape motifs at that time are depictions of foreign nature from geographically remote areas visited by artists during their trips to northern Scandinavia, Italy, France, or Germany. He noticed that the iconography of foreign landscape also reflect a neo-romantic striving for the exotic, extraordinary, and primeval referring to selected Norwegian scenes with deserted monumental fjords and cliffs by painters Wilhelm Spurvites, Gerhard von Rosen, and occasionally Alexander Romans as uh, local expressions of the general turn of the century fascination with Scandinavian motives. In a brief summary of the context of this tendency, Klavinsch wrote, around 1900, Scandinavian and Finnish artists, constantly depicting their country and its people, had, been become, had become popular in Europe. 
the French Impressionist leader Claude Monet, on his turn traveled to Norway in 1895, painting its fjords and snow, Russian artists discovered the scenery of the Russian north. His following study about international contacts uh, was structured biographically, establishing foreign influences and analogies in the work of particular Latvian artists in our country. This approach defined one of the main paths of development in the research of turn of the 20th century art from the perspective of the century's final post-Soviet decade uh, and the turn of millennia. The Nordic context in particular was reconstructed, for instance, in uh, Inta Pujates article, Janis Rosenthal's and the Art of Nordic Countries, where she, as one of the main experts of his life and work, established close Nordic, Nordic analogies and obvious prototypes to many of his works, ranging from Finnish to Swedish and Norwegian sources. In another publication around that time, Eduard Skljavinsk himself did the same with the European context of Wilhelm Spurvi, this landscape painting, identifying, among other, a number of spectacular Nordic parallels to his work. Generally, European context was a key concept in the progress of Latvian art historical research after the fall of the Iron Curtain. And everybody working with the art of this period, including myself, participated in this process. It is already 20 years from now, uh, in 1999, when Sylvia Grosse, researcher of late 19th and early 20th century decorative art in Latvia, currently prof professor at the, the Academy of Art, edited this prominent international conference volume, Art Nouveau, Time and Space. Thank you, Bart, for the reference to this work. That can be considered an important, important precedent of our current venue, just from the perspective of style. In some of her recent publications, Sylvia Grossa has been reflecting among other, about na national romanticism in the architecture of Latvia as a Nordic phenomenon and proposing to use the term Nordic national romanticism. For instance, with regard uh, to such buildings as the former, I will show you one example, the former Atis and Anne Tienisch School in Riga by architects Alexander Svanox and Agents Laube. That's just one example of many, but if we stop a bit, stop a bit at this image, uh, the left one is showing the building as it was reproduced in the first volume of uh, the Baltic Art Yearbook, Bildende Kunst in den Ostseeprovinzen. It may be interesting for our international audience that the Tienisch School also hosts the editorial office of the publishing house and journals Alktis, uh, that we can see in the exhibition. And it was the place of several important art shows, including an exhibition of the Lithuanian Art Society in 1910, providing, among other, the first encounter of Riga public with the art of Churionis. Furthermore, it housed one of the first ethnic Latvian art salons, the short-lived short Saulitis Melder's enterprise, surprising the public with 90, uh, in 1911 with an exhibition of Petris Krastinsch, whose pastel landscapes were appreciated uh, so much during our uh, exhibition tour yesterday. Uh, what wealth of uh, interconnections and entanglements in a single place, indeed. Uh, but the following discussion of my subject uh, will not be comprehensive, of course. A book or a new dissertation would be necessary to grasp most of the aspects. Nevertheless, I invite you to reflect on some of them, 
relating these elements of the scene with what you already know about the turn of the century culture in Latvia, as well as compare them with developments in other countries. First of all, let us look at a small tabular glossary of north-related terms uh, with three columns, Latvian, German, and English. Two of these languages prevailed and competed in the cultural communication in Riga at the turn of the 20th century against the background of increasing Russification. The third one is our lingua franca today. But compiling this list, I wanted to make you taste a bit of peculiar prosodic lyricism, I would say, that permits thinking about the North in Latvian, helping us to perceive it as a part of um, wide-ranging neo-romantic development. Ziema, ziemeļi zeme, ziemelis, ziemeļvēš, ziemeļmeita, ziemeļblāzma, kāvi, quite different. As you can notice, a very close semantic relationship unites the Latvian North, Ziemeli, and Latvian winter, Ziema, both made of the same stuff phonetically and morphologically. Thinking about this relationship, we can look at a famous painting by Wilhelm Spurvitis, having had two versions of its title in the early 20th century. Ziemeļu nakts and Ziemeļu ziems nakts. Nordische nacht, Nordische winternacht, winternacht, northern night, northern winter night. Uh, one of those that established Purvīta's name in the international art scene right after the turn of the century and made his fame proverbial, really proverbial in the Baltic provinces. It was considered lost at least since the Second World War until its uh, relatively recent rediscovery in Latvian exile and acquisition by the Latvian National Museum of Art. So one of the not many happy end stories in uh, the research uh, of Purvitis heritage. But let us learn another Latvian term from the list. Ziemeļblāzma. Aurora Borealis, developing into a local cultural symbol since 1903, when Latvian industrialist, philanthropist, and neo-romantic idealist August Dombrovskis made the previous Milgravis Social Society active in the area of his sawmills near Riga become Ziemeļblāzma Temperance Society. In 1904, it celebrated the opening of a special house that you see on the right side of the slide. But during the following revolution, this building, however, was built, burned down by a punishing unit in early 1906. After activities in a temporary pavilion, the Ziemeļblāzma Society moved into a new, really palace-like, palace-scale scale building in 1913, reputedly designed by Dombrovskis himself. The special role of Aurora Borealis as a symbol of his philanthropist activities was commented uh, by uh, Dombrovskis' son-in-law, engineer Janis Linters, who was informed that August, as a little child, was struck by the magnificent light of Ziemelblasma in the emptiness of a dark icy night at, in Kangarax, a suburb of Riga, and all his life long he tried to create a sense of such splendor in the emptiness of suffering hurts. That's why Ziemelblasma was built. For Dombrovskis, 
This visual phenomenon obviously suggested overwhelming emanation of light able to transform human lives in a positive way. And this meaning was also encoded in some poetic exercises he left behind. In this context, it is interesting to consider the groundbreaking poetry collection Tāls Noskaņas Zilā Vakara, Distant Moods in a Blue Evening of 1903 by Rainis, the key figure in the history of Latvian literature. In his poem, Jauna Gadu Simtaņa Nakts Domas, Night Thoughts of a New Century, the new 20th century looms large, red, increasing, expanding, and menacing like Ziemelblasma. Thus, a quite different aspect of this image is revealed, making us sense uh, the ambiguity of its perception. And more or less also the ambiguity of that time and its developments. August Dombrowski's owned a number of prominent artworks by his Latvian compatriots, including some famous paintings by Rosenthal, such as uh, From the Graveyard and the Berkeley-inspired symbolist Black Snake, both now uh, in the Latvian uh, National Museum of Art. Furthermore, he opened a boarding home for writers, artists, and musicians the so-called Burtnieke House in 1908, inviting creative compatriots to live and work in Mil Gravis, thus uh, contributing to the cultural aims of the Ziemelblasm Society. In a famous photograph from uh, 1911, representing a group of lodgers and their guests in front of the Burtnieke House, uh, we can recognize, among others, a young man who was associated with other embodiments of Nordic symbolism. It is writer Karl Skalbe standing on the right side of the first row, and his activities make us compare two words of similar and at the same time entirely different meaning, Ziemelblasm and Kabe. Although they describe the same phenomenon, the compound feminine known Ziemelblasma suggests something unified and all-embracing, a sort of Gesamtkunstwerk in the sky, whereas Kavi, a masculine plural noun, goes back to archaic Latvian beliefs that Arctic lights are restless souls of fallen soldiers continuing their battle in heaven. In the late 1905, Karl Skalbe started a short-lived cultural journal Kavi that was banned after its two first issues to be continued as um, an anthology, Ziemes Nactis, Winter Nights, that you can see in the exhibition with the same cover drawing by artist Waldemar Zeltinsch. Skalbe Skalbe were going to fight for cultural emancipation. Later on, this word was used in the names of periodicals repeatedly until the outbreak of the First World War brought to the fore its reference uh, to a military conflict in the title of the journal Kara Kavi, Kavi of War, Lights of War. Also, Zeltin's cover is very expressive. The meaning of Kavi requires the color of blood and um, I have arbitrarily selected two non-Latvian paintings from our exhibition, works by Nikolai Trik and Antanas Zmojdzinavičius that unwittingly refer uh, to this concept. With Skalbe, let us proceed to another Nordic image on the list, North Wind's daughter, Latvian Ziemelmeita, 
another beautiful compound noun with a specific phonetic texture in the combination of convex and concave elements, E and A. In uh, 1904, already before the start of Kave, Skalbe's classic literary tale, Kā es braucu ziemeļmeitas lūkoties, how I traveled to see the North Wind's daughter, another translation, how I traveled to marry the North Wind's daughter, was published. The same year, brought August Saulietis poetry collection Sniega Laukos in the Fields of Snow, where a poem, Ladus Karaliene, the Queen of Ice, begins with a description of a black, rocky island far in the northern sea, housing the castle of the sleeping queen, Ziemelmeita, with fantastic towers, its splendor shining in the abundant light, abundant light of Ziemelblasma. In Latvian culture, the imagery, at the, this imagery at that time was not quite new. As it went back to the adventures of large places, Beerslayer, in the epical uh, poem by Andres Pumpurs, first published in 1888. He yearned to roll with waves down to the sea and with the north wind's icy blast to fight and gaze upon the north, wind, north wind's daughter free, who like the northern dawning's gentle light would cool his favored brow and calm his breast. If not directly, numerous visual references in the literature of that time may help us to understand, for instance, what contemporaries recognized, appreciated, and experienced uh, in the paintings by uh, Wilhelm Spurvitis and his um, colleagues. Turning back to the key visual artists and their Nordic connections, we must consider the role of St. Petersburg, the so-called Palmyra of the North, as their main place of studies and center of artistic exchange. In the second half of the 1890s, Friedrich Ross, who succeeded Julius Norden as art reviewer of the German St. Petersburger Zeitung, loved to identify the changing sources of inspiration in the work of Johann Walter and Wilhelm Spurvitis. Our foreign exhibitions go not unnoticed by perceptive young artists, and some of them use every opportunity to learn. Albert Edelfeld and Fritz Taulo were named as their inspirers in a positive way. In 18 97, Purvitis and Walter worked on their graduation paintings in the latter's native town of Jalgava, and they returned to St. Petersburg to get prepared for the final competition at the academy, coincided with a large exhibition of Scandinavian painting organized by Sergei Tiagilev. A revelation for many admirers of Whistler in the Russian capital was the, exhi the exhibited part of Wilhelm Hammershoi's painting, including, among other, this image of a seamstress. And we can presume, judging from descriptions and references, uh, that Walter's refined, dim interior scenes of the next following years were partly inspired by the impulses from Hammershaus' art. Purvitis' decisive success in the competition of graduation pieces, reputedly, was an achievement of two famous guest members of the jury, Ander Zorn from Sweden and Albert Edelfeld from Finland. In a letter to Latvian writer Blaumannis, 
Rosenthal's even referred to Edelfeld's opinion that Purvides would become the most appreciated artist of the nation in any other European uh, country. Be that as it may, his winter scenes at the turn of the 20th century, including the Nordic Night, as one of the most famous examples, were successfully exhibited and acclaimed throughout Europe. At the same time, and especially after the Finnish success in the World Exhibition in Paris, the Riga Art Society worked a lot to make the local public acquainted with this new inspiring phenomenon. Although the first Finnish exhibition in 1901 was a low range disappointment, two important events marked the next year, 1902, when the Riga Art Society Salon hosted first a selection of uh, Gallen Kallilas works, and then a high quality uh, collection from the all of the highest authors. The simplest painting Archer by Veino Alfred Blomstedt was uh, purchased for the Art Society's collection and uh, the uh, identifiable uh, exhibits also included, for instance, Edelfeld's Woman Outside the Church of Rukolachti. Dr. Roderich von Engelhardt the best contemporary expert on Wilhelm's Purvitis art and promoter of various modern developments before becoming uh, absolutely intolerant against cubism and futurism, uh, was absolutely happy about this achievement. Here we can learn that modern art is not a whim of fashion to be overcome at a short notice but a rebirth springing from the depths of the artistic spirit, the end of epigonism and beginning of a true renaissance. We are standing full of admiration of Finland's cultural and artistic development. We are marveling that people of Finland were brave enough to break with all prejudices, become modern in the best sense of the word and stay Finnish at the same time. The year 1902 marked the beginning of the most important story in the artistic context between Riga and Finland. Falling in love with Finnish singer Elie Forsell, Janis Rosenthal acquired a second homeland, Finnish relatives, and inevitably became the best Latvian expert of Finnish art, getting inspired himself and sharing his enthusiasm not only uh, in his artworks, but also in a six-part series of articles entitled On Finnish Art, published in uh, the journal Vairotas in 1905. Asking for Ellie Farsell's hand in the late 1902, Rosenthal wrote to her father that all of your culture, chiefly artistic, is like an example for me and as a painter, I have the highest respect for your masters, such as Gallen, Jönefeld, Hallonen, Sarinen, etc. The whole list of uh, exhibitants in the art society that year. And my desire is to become something similar in Latvia if my modest talent and our circumstances allow this. The admiration expressed in this often quoted passage seems very close to the one we felt in Roderich von Engelhardt's opinion about the Finnish exhibition in Riga. Looking at Rosenthal's portrait of Engelhardt from 1901, we can think of them as greatly like-minded figures of the Baltic art scene. Nevertheless, a split in their cultural efforts happened to be related exactly to Nordic art and its perception. In the first years of the 20th century, a city art museum was being built in Riga to the design of its future director, art historian, and architect Wilhelm Neumann. 
Before the outbreak of the Russo-Japanese War, it was planned to be finished and open in 1904, offering new rooms to the Riga Art Society as well. In March of this year, Roderich von Engelhardt applied to other members of the society, proposing to mark this new start with an unprecedented ambitious Nordic exhibition, Nordische Ausstellung, expanding the scale and context of representation from Baltic to Nordic. In this prospect, he wrote, considering the nature of our country, envisioning the ways of its people, we can generally say that our homeland and ourselves have a Nordic pronouncedly Nordic character. A Nordisches, aussprechend Nordisches Gepräge. Baltic art can become really Baltic only when it leaves this important aspect not unrespected. Our models are to be found not in Romanic countries, they are in the north, in our neighboring countries that already have a network of our longed for authentic Heimatkunst. The prospect included a list of names, such artists as Richard Berg, Anders Zorn, Gustav Jestad, August Hagborg, Karl Larsson, and Bruno Liljefors, who represent Sweden, Fritz Taulo Norway, Albert Edelfeld, Magnus Enkel, Ero Jernefeld, Axel Gallen Kallela, Pekka Hallonen, Elian Sarinen, Hugo Simberg, Finland, but uh, Alexander Benoit, Philip Malavin, Nikolai Röhrich, Valentin Sirov, Konstantin Somov, and Ferdinand Ruschitz, Russia. The society's general meeting initially decided to support Engelhardt's project, and information on the upcoming art show appeared not just in the local press, uh, but also in uh, the Münchner Allgemeine Zeitung. To ensure the quality of selected works, an internationally recognized Baltic painter would be sent by the society to visit the, study, the studios of all these foreign artists to select the most appropriate exhibits, and it seemed self-evident to entrust this mission to Purvitis. These decisions, however, were opposed by a group of eight local artists who persuaded the Regard Society to give up this ambitious idea. Instead, this group promised to show the whole body of artists working in the Baltic provinces and present the public with each artist's originality to create a strong, in order to create a stronger ground for the future development of Baltic art. This group who signed uh, the petition uh, was associated with uh, an uh, unofficial group, Kunstecke, the art corner that uh, uh, became a legal society in order to organize this exhibition afterwards. A deliberate egalitarian culture prevailed in this group and its core members endeavored to avoid a context whereby some internationally more renowned colleagues, especially Purvitis and to a certain extent also Walter, would enjoy perhaps more of the limelight than others. As disagreements were brewing, Purvitis hoped uh, the conflict between the art society and Riga artists could be resolved if he resigned from the art society's board and his special role as the exhibition organizer. In autumn 1904, during the Art Society's annual meeting, the journalist Alfred Rutz, in his report, gave a critical summary of this cultural political dispute. He still held the opinion that this had been a very good idea to consecrate the first art museum in the Baltic lands with an outstanding selection of Nordic art 
we still have much to learn from its strong, serious nature and particularly specific originality. This is especially true in the case of Finns. And we should be eager to compete with their vigor. And precisely the new museum opening exhibition would have provided the right time and place for this. Among the opponents, of course, were some artists who dreamed about competing with other Northern European painters. Let us remember Rosenthal's letter to his future father-in-law. However, in the concrete situation, such wrestling must have seemed unwelcome in the local art life and its outcome could affect public opinion and the art market in unpredictable ways. Because of this, reflections of international horizons became a kind of uh, disturbance in the Riga's art circles. Artistic impulses of other centers were not dismissed, in most cases just the opposite, but there was an attempt to avoid open comparison and rivalry that would affect the local critics and viewers' ideas on values and originality. As the opening of the museum was postponed, the Baltic exhibition organized by the opponents was held a year later in 1905 without contributions of Purvitis and Walter. But Highlandic Rosenthal's and the Borchert couple, as well as introducing, for instance, one more of our current exhibitors, the young Latvian-related Lithuanian artist Petr Skalpokas. In more than a century, Rosenthal's symbolist paintings of that time finally enjoyed the missed opportunity to compete and shine in a predominantly Nordic company when the exhibition Symbolism and Decadence, a Nordic perspective mentioned yesterday by Ginta and today by Bart, was held uh, on the occasion of Prince Eugen's 150th anniversary in Stockholm. With regard to North-related elements in symbolist fantasies in our exhibition, I would like to point to its, if I'm not mistaken, single woman artist, Latvian Emilia Gruzite, represented with her fantastic landscape painted presumably around 1910. And she is also a person who would be happy to shine and compete in this company. In the catalog essay, Datze Lamberga writes, the odd and laconically abstract masses which remind one a frozen tracts of forest are non-decipherable and testify to the artist's courage in the direction of simplification forms. It is possible, she assumes, that Gruzita was influenced by Wilhelm's Purvitis landscapes with their massive angular icebergs created after his 1909 trip to northern Norway and the Svalbard Islands. End of the quotation. Bearing in mind the popular literary imagery by Latvian writers, remembering about Zimel Blasma and Zimel Meita, one may, however, presume that Gruzite may have visualized an um, enchanted northern isle from large places or another literary source, perhaps even of her own writing, emulating some of the models. Reading art history news this winter, I have been intrigued to learn about a conference inventing the pictorial north held in Greifswald just a couple of weeks ago uh, with a particular focus on aspects that are strongly related to my subject. I uh, suppose that there are some participants of this event among us, among the audience today, who may be willing to share uh, their impressions and ideas in the discussion part. Furthermore, there is 
a seemingly small aspect that may be interesting to experts uh, revisiting our exhibition still during its last Tallinn days, although most of us have seen it already many times. Just as a Norwegian colleague Wiebeke was surprised at the amount, at the number of landscapes painted in Norway by early 20th century Estonian artists, uh, this exhib uh, exhibition has also brought a number of works by non-Estonian artists to their place of birth, or at least uh, to a place, to a stop in their preceding exhibition history. Thus, for instance, the winter landscape by Purvitis from around 1908 should be a work of his Tallinn period, and uh, we could go on uh, in a similar way, uh, identifying returning paintings already seen by uh, the people here uh, in the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, for instance, in the traveling exhibitions and uh, the exhibitions of Baltic Art Society by Rosenthal, Spurvi, Tiskalpokas, and still other, on some occasions, still other artists. And last but not least, uh, the closing day, 3rd of February, by coincidence, uh, is the 150th uh, anniversary of Johann Walter. Thank you uh, for your attention, and I hope to receive some interested questions. I want to thank you so much for that incredible lecture. And I think it's rare that we experience, um, in such a short time, an institutional history, an ideological analysis, um, personal histories, formal analytical work, um, entanglement history, so I, I, and, and the network theory that you brought to bear is really rich, and I think it opens up so many questions um, for, for all of us. I had a couple of questions for you to start, and then um, we'll open up the conversation to the larger group. And something that struck me as you were speaking about to return to the beginning of your talk and the notion of the aurora borealis. I wonder if, um, and this could be just really naive and wrong, but on an ideological level in thinking about, um, you know, so-called Baltic self-fashioning mm -hmm. or Nordic mm -hmm. self-fashioning or the Nordic or Norden, um, one of the things that I wondered about is the fact that um, in the early 1890s, the Norwegian polar explorer Fritjof mm -hmm. Nansen went to the North Pole and then published his phenomenally mm -hmm. important book, Furthest North, and began to popularize the Aurora Borealis as a phenomenon. And there were nonsense clubs all over the world, and I'm assuming that there were some, I don't, I just, I don't know enough, but they were literally international. And I'm wondering if the idea of the North and the Northern Lights played a kind of an ideological role in that, in the period of Russification, the Northern Lights had become very much identified with Nansen and with Norwegian science. Um, thank and you for the question. It is something I didn't mention uh, in my lecture, but actually uh, this travel account by, of Nansen was translated uh, into Latvian and published in a series of publications. But, but it's interesting that this translation uses this old kavi, not ziemeliblasma, not aurora borealis, but ziemeliblasma, uh, this uh, archaic version. It is just the choice of um, the translator. But I'm sure that it influenced uh, also uh, the spirit uh, uh, in the Latvian society and uh, was uh, read enthusiastic, enthusiastically uh, by uh, lots of people. Uh, but, uh, for instance, August Dombrowskis is much uh, older than Nansen. <laughs> his experiences as a child, it is already something that, uh, that he had uh, brought with him uh, 
since his uh, early years, so that uh, many things coincide. It's a kind of entanglement yeah. where Nansen and uh, his achievements and experiences and very uh, beautiful descriptions, very visual descriptions of what he uh, had experienced there, also in Latvian, they contributed uh, to something more uh, multi-layered and entangled that had already roots uh, in Latvian myth mythology, in Latvian superstitions, in Latvian literary culture. It's really an entanglement. It's an mm -hmm. entanglement. And I, I was wondering about the temporality of it, though, as um, just to, to ask two more follow-up questions. Mm -hmm. And one is the, um, the emergence of the notion of the Nordic is if you could sort of locate that a little more specifically temporally. Um, mm. Actually, uh, I was focusing on uh, the turn of the century period, uh, but uh, if we look back uh, into period, uh, into materials uh, related uh, to art uh, and uh, uh, art criticism, art organizations, uh, uh, various developments, we can find instances uh, of uh, writing about Nordic achievements, not using this term Nordic, but uh, just uh, Swedish or Finnish, uh, in a very positive way already in, uh, let's say, 1917s by a very prominent and active uh, figure of the art scene. Leopold von Petzold, who is offering uh, Finnish art organizations and uh, Finnish developments, but more institutional, not artistic, as a model. Uh, but uh, this thinking more uh, in Nordic, general Nordic terms, it increases with the end of the century uh, from various, com with various developments uh, coming together. No, thank you, thank you for that. And then, um, because I, I think it's really striking that that there is, I think, as you positioned at the very beginning of your talk, that this moment, uh, this period of Russification, um, led to various kinds of self definitions and affiliations. Um, and the Nordic strikes me as very, very interesting for mm. a host of reasons. As does the focus on Finland, mm. for a host of reasons yeah. as well. Oh. Uh, that's th th this this focus is uh, natural and that's interesting it's something I was thinking about today I was sure that I will not mention it directly in my speech uh, but uh, let's imagine young uh, artists to be studying in the uh, 1890s uh, in the academy in St. Petersburg where they are all considered Russian and at the same time Finland is part of Russia uh, but uh, is considered culturally, also from a Russian perspective, as something, uh, as a country, as a culture on its own rights. So, for instance, in uh, 1898, uh, Sergei Yakovlev, uh, the next year of this, after this Scandinavian exhibition, is organizing uh, a very prominent and groundbreaking ground-breaking uh, Finnish, Finno-Russian uh, art exhibition with two components, Finnish and Russian. And this Russian component includes also Purvitis as an uh, invited exhibitor and uh, actually marks uh, his first steps uh, into the Western world as part of this Russian culture, which is uh, multi-ethnic, and of course, Baltic people uh, want a recognition of their own identity. But the problem is that this uh, identity is, or ide set of identities are conflicting. Uh, ethnic Latvian, ethnic Estonian, that want to show, show their uh, independence uh, and uh, uh, emancipation in 
culture, and at the same time Baltic, uh, that is uh, on one hand a territorial notion referring uh, to all people uh, coming from the Baltic uh, provinces, but uh, on the other hand, at the same time, associated predominantly this Baltic German, Baltic German culture as the unifying element, uh, the discriminating element of this uh, area. And uh, the artists, such as Rosenthal's, who uh, were ready uh, to combine both uh, very, uh, so to say, elastically and uh, without an inner conflict uh, between the Latvian and the Baltic. Uh, for th some other artists, uh, especially younger ones, uh, it was important to set themselves apart, to define them as ethnic Latvian and to receive recognition as Latvians. And uh, so it was a very <laughs> mixed <laughs> phenomenon. Also, uh, these are all ideological constructions and there are many parallels and relationships that we see and sense in the art. Great, thank you. Um, I'm guessing there are a lot of questions and comments that you all have. There's a question. Thank you so much for a very interesting uh, paper you gave. And uh, uh, just within this hour, I, I, know, I know a lot more about uh, the Baltic art history. That's uh, very interesting. Uh, I'll just have some few following up questions. And uh, this Nor Norwegian perspective, uh, you, you mentioned Norwegian several times. And uh, some of the, these artists traveled to Norway, as far as I understood. Uh, yes, uh, you yeah, are right. but the only Norwegian mm -hmm. artist you mentioned was uh, Fritz Taulov. Mm -hmm. uh, but do you know about any other of the? Was uh, for instance Harald Solberg or any other artist mentioned? And uh, did I see any art of uh, other more symbolic Norwegian artists? Munte, for instance. Uh, this is one of my questions. And um, uh, the other thing is from a Scandinavian perspective. Denmark is very important in this period in the art world, as, as especially from a Norwegian perspective. Uh, how did they look? Was there any relations there between the Baltic and Denmark? Uh, if you just could reflect a little bit upon that. And one more question. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> you mentioned this exhibition in St. Petersburg yeah. with Nordic art. Yeah. Uh, that was I hadn't heard about that, but do you know? Uh, is it known which artist was included? That's a very concrete question, but yeah. Oh, a real set of questions. Yeah. I will start from the end. Uh, at home, <laughs> but not with me. Uh, I have uh, excerpts from the catalog of the exhibition. Uh, there was a wide range, really wide range of artists represented. Uh, and uh, I was focusing, of course, when studying this material in St. Petersburg many years ago um, on uh, those who were closest uh, to uh, the artists I was researching at that moment. Uh, but uh, I could give you a more complete uh, answer afterwards coming back to this material uh, because this exhibition was very, very important. and uh, I. I can get a list of art, artists represented there. Uh, farther on, um, of course, uh, the Roderick von Engelhardt's uh, prospect of the Nordic exhibition included uh, just uh, Fiestad, but uh, at the same time, uh, most of the modern artists in Latvia were more of less or less acquainted with the work of Munch, uh, basically from uh, publications and exhibitions in Berlin. Uh, and uh, over, over this uh, other direction of artistic contacts uh, with the uh, German centers. And uh, we, 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 we could uh, also um, 
speak about uh, very close analogies uh, and uh, even uh, some occasions of uh, getting inspired from Munch. Mm. That is uh, another aspect. And uh, speaking about uh, Scandinavia as a whole and northern countries as a general context, uh, concept, uh, including Finland, that was not an independent, politically independent country at that time, but culturally independent. Finland was the most important, uh, especially because uh, of its uh, special status. Uh, Baltic countries, uh, as, uh, as uh, ba the Baltic provinces as a whole, and uh, even uh, Estonia and Latvia alone, uh, they, uh, at that moment, they could only dream about a kind of similar uh, political and cultural uh, status that Finland had in, in uh, the Russian Empire. And uh, it is also, it, it affected uh, this uh, role of Finland as a model in various aspects. Uh, on the other hand, the main focus uh, in contacts, uh, very direct contacts, including visits uh, and uh, exchanges of exhibitions with Sweden, with uh, less interest and direct contacts, for instance, with Denmark, uh, but uh, some uh, impulses and uh, some direct exchanges are not excluded. Perhaps there was still something that you uh, that I missed in your questions, but but we can come back to them later. I think. And could I follow up for oh, one yeah, second? Yeah, of course. Um, Marit Verenschald has done extensive work on the 1897 exhibition, so you'll find actually literature in Norwegian uh, on on that from from the Norwegian perspective, which is. Mm -hmm. Um, which is interesting. I also wanted to follow up by asking a question about the, your question about Denmark and Denmark mm. being very important within the Scandinavian mm. um, context. But you know, it's sort of interesting that it's Nor Norway and Finland, obviously, mm -hmm. but Norway as well, because that was a country with a very powerful mm -hmm. nation building yeah. set of yeah. efforts, mm -hmm. and because so many of the mm -hmm. landscape paintings mm -hmm. and so mm -hmm. much of the crafts work was so mm -hmm. much about. Uh, trying to assert a distinctive mm -hmm. identity at a moment mm -hmm. when they had been Danified mm -hmm. for 400 years. Of course. And yeah. then um, under Swedish protectorate. So I think that this, you know, on an ideological level, as mm -hmm. you've been speaking, these two struggling entities trying to assert autonomy mm -hmm. under a colonial yeah. identity mm -hmm. were very important models. So mm -hmm. I think that's extremely important. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. More questions or comments? Thank you. Um, my name is Maria Lahelma. I come mm -hmm. from the University of Helsinki mm -hmm. in Finland, and I just wanted to thank you for a very fascinating talk, and, and I also learned a lot from that. And I started, started to wonder a little bit about this um, geographical and cultural terminology that we are using. You mentioned the Baltic exhibition that Bart also talked about. And um, I think this is kind of an invitation for all of us, but also I, I would like to hear your comments on how these terms were used and are used and have been used, uh, such as um, Baltic, Scandinavian, Nordic. Um, because I have found in the Finnish material, for, for example, um, sometimes Finnish artists in the late uh, 19th century, they. Uh, refer to themselves as Nordics, mm -hmm. which I find very interesting because the idea of Finland being a Nordic country it wasn't really fully established mm -hmm. until mm -hmm. after the Second World War. And then also like the, the term Baltic, which uh, in the Finnish language there's a, a, a completely different word for the Baltic Sea, which is mm -hmm. interestingly is the eastern See, mm -hmm. although it's not east from Finland, but it's a mm -hmm. translation mm -hmm. from the Swedish term, Estesjön. Yeah. 
Uh, and then the Baltic countries are, are referred to by the term Baltic. So we don't really kind of mix those two. Yeah, it's, yeah. A, it's a completely mm -hmm. different thing. Mm -hmm. So I was just wondering if you could uh, yeah. comment a little mm -hmm. bit on that. Yeah, that's a very interesting question. And uh, we already noticed, yeah, this in Bart's introduction, this reference to the Baltic exhibition of 1914, that was actually an exhibition of the Baltic Sea region, of the countries around the Baltic Sea. Uh, but uh, in a view from Riga at the turn of the 20th century, or from Tallinn or elsewhere in uh, Estonia, Livonia and Kurland, that were the so-called Baltic provinces of the Russian Empire, Baltic uh, referred uh, to everything related to coming from these three uh, northwestern provinces of the empire. Baltische uh, Provinzen, Ostsee Provinzen. Ostsee, that's the same uh, Eastern Sea also in German. Uh, but uh, art, culture, uh, industries, developments, and everything else was described as Baltic. And uh, here it meant just geographically these three provinces uh, that uh, became the core of two of three future Baltic states. So uh, we can identify here uh, historically changing and overlapping, so in part overlapping meanings. And uh, what I also pointed out in my talk, uh, this prospect by Roderich of, uh, von Engelhardt, of this uh, Nordische Ausstellung, Nordic Art uh, exhibition that was planned and was cancelled. Uh, the idea uh, behind it, his aim was to incorporate, incorporate the Baltic into the Nordic ideologically and artistically. Uh, but uh, it didn't work at the moment so well as it was intended to be. There's a question here. Thank you very much for the very, very informative talk. Just f a few uh, comments, which I think are very important for us when we're dealing with these terminolog terminological issues and also when we are talking about contacts between the various regions. First of all, there is actually surprisingly little contact in the region during this time, which is direct, uh, which is not mediated. And what I mean by that is really that the uh, engagement with Finland took place to a great degree place in St. Petersburg. It was in St. Petersburg where the contacts really were, where there were, there was a tremendous, a tremendously large Swedish community, a tremendously large Finnish community. There was an uh, Ingrian community, of course there was Estonian, Northern and Southern, and so forth and so forth. So I think it's very important to see how indirect very frequently these cultural transitions or these cult this cultural exchange takes place. Uh, that aside, I would like to talk about a very direct link between Finland and the um, let's use the real terms now, uh, Estland, Liefland, and Kurland. That's what we're really talking about when we're talking about Baltic in this particular context. The fact is that after 1721, the eastern part of Finland, which we now associate with Karelia and with Viborg and that uh, whole region, that was an integral part of the cultural zone of the three Baltic provinces, so to say. In other words, to the degree that the school systems in the Baltic provinces and in that part of Finland were the same. 
In other words, school books were being published in Reval or Riga for use in Viborg, which of course was probably approximately 30% uh, German speaking, 30% uh, Russian speaking, 30% uh, Finnish speaking, and probably 10% or less Swedish speaking or something like that. So in other words, you had uh, a, uh, an educational infrastructure which was probably connecting in a way that nothing else could connect. As we know, if you have a good educational system, you can completely transform the region the most classic case of uh, this being the split of Leafland into two areas took place basically in the space of five years by just drawing a border uh, uh, with the independent states, a border which was the, the only criterion of that border was really language. And if we would draw borders by language in what we call the Scandinavian territory or in, even in Finland or somewhere else, we'd have tremendous, tremendous difficulties. Wherever, wherever you try to have a border which is purely linguistic is, <laughs> spells trouble. <laughs> uh, so just, as I said, indirect contacts on the one hand and directness which can sometimes be subsumed in educational reforms and so forth. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much for this uh, cultural historical context. Uh, a very interesting comment, but uh, coming back uh, to uh, the institutional history of art uh, in a strict sense, uh, I must remind that uh, all uh, contacts with Finland and uh, Sweden um, for the Riga Art Society, I mean not this society this as a scene, but society as an institution, uh, Riga Kunstverein, uh, were direct, direct contacts. Sometimes they were not very successful, uh, sometimes yes, but if we study the archives, uh, the archive collection of uh, the society that survives, we find uh, numerous autographs by Galen Kallela and other Finnish artists, and uh, this material can be also interesting from uh, researchers uh, of other countries. I think there's probably time for one more question or comment. Thank you for a very rich talk. I'm Linda Kailende from the University of Tallinn. And my question concerns the role of representations of history in constructing a Nordic identity. If one looks at the Estonian visual culture and culture at large at that period, then this kind of refashioning of the ancient Estonians and so also the heroes of the national mm -hmm. epic as kind of Vikings and, and stressing these close connections to uh, the Nordic lands, especially in the ancient and Viking period was a very important topic and, and one very powerful means of uh, creating a more Nordic identity for the Estonians and their national movements. And I think that's also visible in the sportic symbolism exhibition However, in the Latvian visual arts, this kind of uh, tendency seems to be lacking. And, and also in your talk, you emphasized more this kind of idealization of the Nordic nature as a way of creating Nordic identity. And how, how would you explain this difference? Um, yeah, that's surprising. Uh, but uh, a partly right answer, perhaps, would, be, uh, would lie in the specificity of uh, the artists of their biographies and personalities. Actually, we have uh, two artists of the late 19th century, two Latvian artists, who uh, worked very much with the historical material. But none of them uh, is uh, represented here, if I'm not mistaken, Arthur Baumanis and Adam Salksnes. Uh, they both died yearly. Alksnes already in 1897 and uh, living a rich heritage of uh, basically drawings uh, partly about historical and mythological themes, ancient Latvian history. Uh, and Arturs Baumanis in 1904, 
he was very interested in this subject matter, uh, but uh, they uh, still failed uh, to combine uh, this uh, iconography with uh, an expressive modernization of style that we see with Christian Raud and so on. Perhaps if they would, live, would have lived longer, <laughs> it would look different in Latvian history. But uh, yeah, my uh, first intuitive answer uh, would point uh, to these uh, short lives. I think we can maybe squeeze one more quick question in, actually. If there is any. And if not, I think there's a lot of time to speak over lunch <clears throat> and as the days proceed. But I, you know, thank you so much for the, for the talk. And I think the question of, of um, self, regional self-fashioning is extremely interesting on an ideological level in terms of aesthetic associations, in terms of the network uh, building that you discussed. And all of this, I think, is going to be playing out in many of the talks that will be um, coming up today and tomorrow. So thank you sure. for a really brilliant introduction to thank this. You thank you very you. much and thank you everybody.